let's go into this issue of the complexity of values and the conflict between different values and the oppositions. Uh, let's go into that a little bit more. So, in a way, it's obvious that um, a value is in a kind of oppositional, conflictual relationship with uh, with its opposite, with, with a disvalue. Um, so these are obvious oppositions. So, for example, kindness is... Um, of the value of kindness is an oppositional relationship with a value, you know, unkindness, which we call a disvalue. It's an absence of a value. It's a, uh, something that has an, uh, a disvalue. Or loyalty with disloyalty, honesty with dishonesty, and um, courage with cowardice. Those kinds of oppositions are kind of obvious. And in a way, although they present... Um, they can arise in a way that um, uh, the choice challenges us uh, to the choice towards a value challenges us. It may ask a lot of us in different situations. Um, still, that um, opposition is uh, c- kind of obvious and not not complicated, not kind of essentially problematical, theoretically problematical. But there are others, and we've already. Uh, touched on them or, or thrown them out as examples at different stages of the talk, um, there are others that are more problematic, other oppositions, other co- conflicting um, duties and allegiances and relationships between different values that are, are more problematic. And Hartman uses this word, I'm not sure what the German is, but um, in English it translates as antinomy or antinomies in the plural. Um, it's uh, philosophical jargon, uh, philosophers speak, for uh, this kind of oppositional relationship. So, uh, anti is anti, like we know, um, and n- n- nomi is from nomos, and nomos is law. So, two laws that pull in opposite direction, anti, nomos, anti, antinomy, antinomies. And we've, as I said, we've touched on a few of these. We've we've um, mentioned a few, uh, some in passing, some in a little more detail. So there is, which I've already mentioned, the antinomy, in a way, the curious antinomy uh, between the actualization of a value uh, that has value, obviously. To, when when a value is actualized, that actualization is valuable. And, but there's also a value in its non-actualization, because its non-actualization, its non-presence, its non-existence, allows us to, in our being, in our moral orientation and moral will, uh, and uh, what we bring of our soul to a situation, that non-actualization of a value in a situation allows us to uh, rise up morally, to discern, to... to to cultivate our sensitivity, to choose, to gather our soul, and to um, grow morally, and uh, through our intention, through our will, etc. Uh, so this curious uh, oppositional uh, relationship between the actualization of, of values and their non-actualization, that in a way both are valuable. And if we just uh, look at that a little, even a little more closely, we have uh, the inner values non-actualization or only partial actualization. We have we have there the values beyondness. The beyondness is what's not completely um, actualizing, what's not completely manifest. And that's valuable for our purpose from a soul-making perspective because of the eros. The eros needs those beyonds. It creates those beyonds. It discovers those beyonds. It needs those beyonds. Um, and those beyonds are part of its non-actualization. That those beyondness are also part of the dimensions, the unfathomability and the divinity and mystery of a value. Uh, and as such, they are... Uh, they are valuable to us because of that soul sense that they give. So there's 
an oppositional relationship between the values beyond this, so to speak, and uh, their manifestation on the other hand. There's also then uh, the value of our moving towards something, as I, as I said before, our engaging of our um, uh, moral capacity, moral sensitivities, moral will, a whole uh, organ of, of ethical sensibility and choice. There's a value in our moving towards something, our striving to actualize a value, and there's a value in our achieving it, our having, uh, having uh, actualized something when there's no more striving uh, there. There's uh, um, an antinomy, perhaps, between acceptance, the, the value, the virtue of acceptance on one hand, and the value, the virtue of, um, let's say, decisive action or effort towards a goal. There's an interesting antinomy between, um, as Hartman points out, between what he calls the grade and the range. So I have to explain what those mean. Um, the grade is a, another word he uses for the, 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 the height of, of, a, of a moral value. So that one can um, pursue single-mindedly uh, and devotedly a single moral value. One can be absolutely devoted uh, to one moral value. Uh, and uh, kind of accentuate one's efforts towards that, one's sensibility towards that, one's uh, the targeting of that value, wh- whatever that is. And in a way, there's value in that. There's value in that single pointedness, in that effort, in that singling out and kind of streamlining of one's beings and one's will and effort towards that one particular value. And Harman points out that a lot of the kind of extraordinary achievements of um, not just individual human beings, but also then uh, kind of uh, with them, the cultures or the traditions that they found also also um, follow from that kind of uh, singleness of moral vision, singleness of moral emphasis. That is really able to develop one virtue or uh, in, in to, to a great extent at the expense, often, of other values, um, a wider range. So it's a grade versus range. There's an antinomy there. Because there's also a value in um, encompassing, being sensitive to taking care of a broad range of values. So it's kind of like, what should we say, depth versus breadth, something like that. And related to this, there's antinomies between simplicity and complexity. And we can even talk about some of these in relation to aesthetics and art. Uh, You know, both simplicity has a value, but complexity has a value. Um, Unity and uniformity um, have a value. Uh, Again, whether we're talking about a, a, a single person and their ethos... Um, or a community, or, or a, a structure, or an institution. Unity and uniformity have a value, but also diversity has a value. And again, if we refine that a little more, the perception of unity, the capacity to see oneness, and not to uh, get uh, focused so much on differences, that has a value. But so does uh, conversely, and at the same time, the perception of diversity, what we might call discernment or differentiation, that also has a value. Uh, constancy has a value. Stability. Constancy and stability are values. Again, we talk about a person, an ethos of, of an individual or an institution or a community or a tradition. Constancy and stability have a value. On the other hand, change and dynamism also have a value. And these are uh, opposing antino- antinomical values. There's a value in harmony, and there's a value in conflict. Uh, 
again, we can talk about the harmony within oneself. I'm not pulled in different directions um, in a way that's disharmonious or, or within a community. Uh, and we touched on already in previous parts of the talk the, the value of conflict in different ways, in different areas. And just, again, read a short passage from Hartman about that. And he cites Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic, pre-Socratic philosopher, uh, what Heraclitus called the cosmic war. Uh, polemos in Greek. Uh, what Heraclitus called the cosmic war and regarded as the father and king of all things. So Heraclitus said polemos is the father of all things. Um, uh, exists also in ethical actuality. What Heraclitus called the cosmic war and regarded as the father and king of all things exists also in ethical actuality. The element of restlessness and of flux which carries all things, that inexhaustible productivity of new and ever new relations, situations and demands with their endlessly new conflicts and puzzles. This it is which constitutes the infiniteness of content in ethical being, its wealth, its eternal freshness and abundance. It is no exaggeration to speak in this sense of conflict as a value. And he gave that example, we, 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 we talked about it before, of a parallel in the domain of knowledge or research or theoretical research or understanding or insight where a problem is, is a value. And he continues, conflict is that from which decision, intention, action are born. But the values of intention are the ethical ones. Conflict is that which keeps discernment and the feeling of value alive and opens up new vistas. Uh, so, again, there's this, there's this antinomy between the value of harmony and the value of conflict. And I'm going through these very quickly. They, they all bear... Uh, quite a lot of meditation upon, reflection upon, they're, they differ. Some of them are obviously related, some of them are ant- antinomical, or in, or antinomial, whatever the adjective is, in, in, in slightly different ways from each other. So, um, for those of you that are interested in this, yeah, you can, you can take, take this on and go into more detail, more richness of exploration of all this. There are also there are, there is also um, a kind of antinomy between our uh, let's say duty to ourselves as individuals and our duty to the community, whatever community we're talking about, whether it's a small community or a la- sub uh, or a larger or a larger community of society. There are all kinds of. Um, interesting tensions and pulls can arise out of, out of that antinomy. There's also um, an antinomy between uh, what Harman calls love of the nearest, those that are nearest to us, and love of the remote. And that's a particular phrase that Hartman, I think, got from uh, his friend and in a way, philosophical predecessor, Max Scheler, who also wrote about ethics. I think that phrase, uh, uh, the remote, uh, we'll, we may come back to that later, because I, I find it quite an interesting one, um, to highlight certain issues uh, around the complexity of ethics and the difficulties and problems we encounter. But love of the remote, very briefly, is uh, a love and devotion to and service of and keeping in mind and working for um, those in the distant future, those far away and in the distant future, and particularly those who one regards as, if you like, um, this is the best types, it's a little problematic language, but those who one pins one's hopes for humanity on, or hopes for a tradition on, or hopes for... Uh, certain deep understandings on, or certain uh, capacity for a kind of um, extraordinary development of soul, or insight, or heart, or courage, or, or whatever it is. And so, some people uh, are devoted in their work now to those 
beings in the future that they will never meet, that they will never know if their work is successful, if it lands, if it's received, if it's assimilated and digested and used as a, as a platform, as a support and as an inspiration. And in that devotion, uh, in that love of the remote, uh, it, in a way, necessitates, to some degree, a pulling away, or a, uh, to some degree, some level of neglect of the love of the nearest, of those that are around us. So maybe um, I'm not that available as a friend. Maybe I'm not that available as I could be. Uh, for the everyday hanging out or whatever, or with my family or my children, because I have my soul's eye and a sense of duty and dedication to those I may never meet, and those whose uh, f- the fruits of which I may never know whether they ripen or not, and I'm, I will never enjoy because they they exist after I die. Um, but is there an antinomy there between love of the nearest and love of the remote? Hartman would say, yes, I, I would tend to agree. Is there, I'm not sure about this one, but is there similar, um, some kind of antimony between the kind of love that one has towards, let's say, one's family, or one's children, and the, the devotion to caring for them and making them happy and uh, being interested in them? Is there, is there an antinomy between that and the kind of the value of universal meta, meta for the far and wide. Not sure. What do you think? And there are others. There are many others. Um, so I said this is this to me is a really rich and important area, um, both in terms of some of its uh, the general principles that are implicated in in that consideration, but also in in the details. Like I said, I'm going through, I just rattled off a whole list there, and there are, there are many others. And they're worth, uh, I think, uh, reflecting on, investigating on, feeling into, becoming sensitive to. So, I'm not sure if Hartman was the first to point this out, uh, the fact of um, uh, antinomies between moral values. I'm not sure. But certainly going back to Plato, uh, Plato's uh, consideration of virtues and ethics was that a virtue, uh, his uh, idea was that, positing, was that a virtue cannot be in conflict with another virtue. It was almost axiomatic to his whole philosophy. There cannot be rival goods at war with each other, to quote Alistair McIntyre's um, Precy of, of Plato's position. And Aristotle, his mm, somewhat student, somewhat successor, uh, somewhat um, foil, uh, uh, held the same view, that virtue cannot be in conflict with virtue. And later, Thomas Aquinas in, in uh, the Middle Ages um, uh, t- took a similar view. I mean, there's differences between Plato, Aristotle and Aquinas, but had a similar view that um, there cannot be really conflict between one virtue and another. They cannot pull in different directions, really. Um, Further, that all virtues kind of require each other as well. So this goes back to what we mentioned about Aristotle and his idea of synthesis. Sometimes he calls it the me, like an average between uh, virtues, that it one virtue actually needs to have a counterweight in another virtue, so that the true virtue is some kind of synthesis of of two, if you like, lesser virtues or incomplete virtues. All virtues require each other uh, in that system. And in some understandings of the Dharma, I would say that's a similar thing, that all the wings of awakening that the Buddha talked about, all the 37 wings of awakening, uh, kind of certainly work synergistically, but may, to some extent, require each other. So that's quite a common ancient uh, view, um, probably in the Buddha, um, certainly in Plato and Aristotle, and uh, in many ways in Thomas Aquinas. Um, And Alistair MacIntyre reflects on this, and he writes that 
find the passage. Um, Aristotle's moral psychology has led him to misread Sophocles, so the, the playwright Sophocles. He's really talking about um, the whole kind of genre of uh, tragic theatre, uh, which was uh, you know, a big kind of artistic um, uh, direction and manifestation in, in um, Greek and Hellenistic times. He said, because of his moral psychology, Aristotle just couldn't get tragic drama. He just, it just made no sense for him, or it made very limited sense. For the conflicts of tragedy, sets of tragedy certainly may in part take the form that they do because of the flaws in uh, this, is this or that character, or this or that other character. But what constitute those individuals' tragic opposition and conflict is the conflict of good with good embodied in their encounter prior to and independent of any individual's characteristics, of any individual characteristics. In other words, it's not really that this person is flawed in this way or that person is flawed in this way. The tragedy is rather that this person is pulled between two antinomical um, values, between a, a, a sense their allegiance is to two um, opposite directions and they're, they're in a way torn apart they have to choose they're forced to choose um, by a situation or by the actual um, the, the deeper structure of the antinomies between certain values and as to Macintyre continues and to this aspect of tragedy Aristotle is and has to be blind the absence of this view of the centrality of opposition and conflict in human life conceals from Aristotle also one important source of human learning about and one important milieu of human practice of the virtues. This is a point I want to emphasize. This is part of our life. These inevitable, unavoidable uh, conflicts that arise either from the structure of the situation or from a deeper, the deeper kind of nature of the complexity of a virtue, of any virtue, or the antinomical nature of those virtues. Remember um, that quote when we were talking about traditions and the necessity of conflict in argument in traditions, and uh, John Anderson urging us to not to ask of a social institution what end or purpose does it serve, but rather of what conflicts is it the scene. So, uh, in a way, missing something there, Aristotle, of the uh, the complexity, but also the fact of our moral life, and perhaps even more so in in a modern society where there is a, a, a wider divergence of the very sense of life and what it's for. And there isn't kind of a unified idea of life is for this and this is how it serves um, uh, this is what it serves and this is in the direction can kind of unite all our soul's energies and our intellect and our ethical aspiration in, into that one uh, that one stream which everyone agrees upon but there is that that view um, that uh, a synthesis is possible and virtue cannot really conflict with virtue. When, but again, it, I would ask, is it, is it possible, um, you know, uh, if one might have that sort of integrated view over time, that values kind of work together. It might still be that on one occasion, or is simultaneously, or in one situation, we're pulled in different directions. I even just remember, I think it uh, came up uh, as a response to a question on the last retreat, but I remember <coughs> a period of time um, when I lived in the States, and it was shortly after the jhanas uh, were kind of really... Well, it was in a period wh when the jhanas were really opening um, quite a lot for me, and I was... I had been on a, a, a solitary retreat and I was practicing a lot at home after that while, while working and all. And what I noticed was that 
there were days when the samadhi was, um, you know, went really well. And so the mind and the being had this kind of um, dualine radiance to them. Very bright, very sharp, very uh, clear. It's like pristine, beautiful uh, (coughs) radiance to it. And there were other days where that was less there. Uh, the samadhi was there, but not 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 to that uh, kind of pristine uh, depth and, and fullness, etc. But what was sometimes there instead was a kind of tender heartedness, a real soft sort of um, pliability, availability of heart, um, tenderness, um, tears in a good sense, being easily moved was. Uh, very available. And what I noticed was <clears throat> that on the days that the samadhi was really bright and kind of radiant, like a like a jewel, the mind was. On those days, there was less of this kind of tender heartedness, and vice versa. On the days where there was tender heartedness, there was less extent of this jewel and kind of um, bright, almost like diamond-like radiance of the mind. Are these antinomical? values, this, what I'm calling right now, tenderness of heart, and uh, the, that kind of bright samadhi uh, mind, heart. They didn't seem to be able to quite exist in their fullness at the same time. So uh, the, 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 the being, the consciousness, the chitta was kind of moving between them, uh, some days here, some days there, etc., or even within one day sometimes. Now, within the Dharma, you do get uh, teachings about balancing different qualities. So, for instance, in the teachings on the seven factors of awakening, um, there's the Bojanga, there's, um, there are those uh, three qualities of the seven, let's see what they are, um, Dhamma Vichai, investigation of Dhammas, investigation of uh, mental qualities, or sometimes investigation of reality, depending on how you translate Dhamma, the investigative quality, virya, the persistence, effort, determination, and uh, PT, rapture. These are all energizing qualities. And then you have three qualities, uh, pasadi, tranquility, samadhi, which we could translate as concentration for now, um, and um, upeka, equanimity, which are all kind of pacifying qualities, uh, calming uh, in their affect and effect. Um, and so you do get teachings uh, uh, that, that so pay attention to this balance. Where am I right now with the seven factors of awakening? And when the Buddha uh, gives this teaching in the fourth foundation of mindfulness, it's one of the kind of uh, f- framework lenses or the lens frameworks of which to regard one's experience, a way of looking. He says to pay attention to, to the balance here. What do I need more of these kind or more of these kind right now in regard to dispelling the hindrances, in regard to cultivating the whole kind of um, engine uh, and, and movement towards awakening. So you get that partially, but I don't know... Um, if this quality of what I'm calling tenderness of heart, it's not meta in itself. It's neither is it compassion itself. It's maybe more akin to empathy, which is not compassion, as I've taught about before in the teachings on compassion uh, from years ago. Whether that quality of, let's say, let's call it tenderness of heart, is antinomical with, um, say, the the brightness and the adamantine quality of samadhi, but that quality of tenderness heart isn't really um, highlighted, certainly in the Pali Canon teachings. Um, so is there an antinomy there of a value that nowadays many people, and certainly many people in insight meditation tradition, less so in some other contemporary uh, Dharma traditions, but I would place a value to it. Is there a way that at the same time it's hard for those both qualities to have a kind of full blossoming?
might, as I said, might there be a kind of inevitability uh, to this, uh, our having to, to negotiate, to choose, to deal with these uh, complexities, these conflicts, these antinomies, these impossibilities. In Mahayana teaching, uh, a, a Buddha, the Buddha nature is said to have three, three bodies, three kayas. The rupa kaya, they sort of um, actually you can you can interpret this as kind of infinite hermeneutic possibilities here, but let's just very simply right now give give them certain narrow slants just for the sake of the point I'm trying to make. Um, in the Mahayana uh, in the Mahayana teachings, a Buddha is has uh, the tr- three kayas, three bodies, if you like, of of their being, of their essence, of what a Buddha is. The rupakaya, the, 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 the body of physical manifestation, if you like. The sambhogakaya, sometimes translated as the bliss body or the enjoyment body. It's also akin to kind of an imaginal uh, body and uh, with its associate an imaginal realm. Um, and the dharmakaya, uh, and we've touched on this word before, and it can, it has had in the Mahayana tradition... Um, a whole wide range of translations is very fertile and, and the hermeneutic opens out in all kinds of directional possibilities there. But I mentioned earlier that one translation of Dharmakaya, and perhaps one of the earlier ones, is Kaya is body, as a body of teachings, body of water, but also body of Dhammas, Dharmakaya, body of Dhammas, meaning body of attributes or mental qualities or, uh, we could say, virtues. Um, and the the Mahayana Buddha is a kind of really a kind of almost unbelievably transcendent entity, uh, far beyond anything we encounter in our uh, typical human lives and, and encountering other human beings. Um, so one translation of Dharmakaya is as a body of of qualities, a body of dhammas, a body of virtues, which actually can't manifest all at once because of their antinomic values, because because they embody antinomic values. Um, so it points again to a kind of beyond, a kind of synthesis, a kind of absolute in that it synthesizes in a way that's beyond our grasp, beyond our ken, beyond our completely discerning or completely understanding in what way can a Buddha um, who, in the Mahayana teaching, has all kinds of mysterious qualities. Um, for instance, being able to see thoroughly the emptiness of something at the same time as perceiving that the form of that thing. Um, but there could be a parallel here between the notion of Dhammakaya as part of uh, the, the, the Buddha nature, as a body of qualities including uh, antinom- antinomical values, and virtues, a body of qualities which actually can't manifest in uh, human beings, can't instantiate all at once. So it kind of implies and suggests this transcendent absolute. And, you know, and as I said, you get teachings in um, the Abrahamic religions about the names and the attributes of God. And they do talk about balancing, for instance, balancing mercy with judgment balancing judgment with mercy, as one example, etc. Um, but there are certain ones that said they can't manifest at the same time. So it might be when we consider uh, this fact of uh, conflicts, complexities, counterweights needed, antinomical relations between different values, and the unavoidability of that, that it prompts us, or it prompts some people, towards the consideration of the possibility of some kind of absolute. That we cannot know rationally, we cannot directly see, we can maybe intuit it, we can have a sense of its beyond, but it is transcendent. And um, perhaps in some ways uh, we might construe the Buddha mind in its um, ineffable transcendence, in its forever beyondness, really, in terms of what a Mahayana Buddha is, I, I would say, as, as kind of um, constituting and 
embody in the kaya that that kind of transcendent absolute, that kind of transcendent synthesis that we ourselves can only get partial glimpses of. Remember that um, that analogy with, with 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 the maps, the Mercator projection, the polar projection. Neither of them, in two dimensions, can uh, capture the the reality of the three of the three dimensional globe. Something gets distorted. Something gets shrunk. Something gets uh, expanded, etc. So this is, as we mentioned before, this is one solution, um, uh, one way of thinking about it, one way also of tying it in with um, Buddha Dharma and notions of Buddhahood and notions of a beyond that we are aspiring to or have in our sight as an inspiration, that of Buddhahood, that of the Dharmakaya. So listen also to John Findlay when he talks about this. Uh, with regard to absolutes. And he says, the absolute is not to be conceived as something which instantiates or exemplifies the highest values, since instantiation is necessarily one-sided and imperfect. And since the highest values also lie in different directions and cannot be instantiated, instantiated altogether point often stressed by Nikolai Hartmann. So there's those two points that we've been stressing in those talks. And instantiation um, is necessarily one-sided and imperfect. Talking about the impossible, the uh, beyond of an image, the beyond of a value. And the instantiation being imperfect, just like with pi and all those mathematical uh, notions we talked about. And also, since the highest values lie in different directions and cannot be instantiated altogether, is the point about the antinomies. No. The absolute, he says, rather is, is all the highest values and is them all together in a unity which transcends one-sided exemplification and one-sided comprehension. We are forced towards a platonic solution as the only way to make the absolute truly comprehensive and axiologically satisfactory. So he is openly, uh, well, in some respects, a, a fan of, of Plato, let's say, just that, um, and favours this idea of a mystical absolute and talks about it, develops it in, in terms of certain kinds of logic, which is interesting, but also in terms of his intuition. So that this absolute, this absolute synthesis, this transcendent absolute, which may have something to do with the nature of the divine, of the Dharmakaya, of the Buddha nature, is really a kind of ideal. Again, we're back to that word, idea, ideal, the realm, the sphere of ideal being uh, that we got from Plato. It cannot um, fully nor exactly manifest it's an ideal reality. But in some senses, it's, it's not only the apex, the, the, um, the, the point of our uh, kind of erotic gaze, or a point of our erotic gaze, it's also a kind of source in some philosophies. I can't remember how it landed on my desk, but I, I, I read an article by Jeffrey Kripal, who's a Kripal, who's a, um, well, I think he's a, let's say he's a scholar of religions, I think, and it's, I want to read you a part of it, and the excerpt is quite long, but um, it's, I think, quite interesting, and um, I want to then comment on it. So he's writing, I don't know if he's writing a book review or what here, but um, he's writing about um, about the writings of another guy called Jorge Ferrer, who discusses um, a kind of, the idea of what's called the perennial philosophy, the idea that actually all philosophy, all religions are, sort of saying the same thing, there are different roads up the same mountain, etc. Um, and Ferrer is uh, not so naive to buy into that, but 
he still makes the case for there are commonalities in terms of the liberation. There are differences, but there are also commonalities in terms of the liberation that uh, issues from from these different paths. <clears throat> and one of the commonalities that Ferrer kind of concludes or stresses um, between different religions and different spiritual traditions and approaches is that they all issue in... Uh, in, in, in a care for ethics. So, awakening or libera- liberation results in um, a transcendence of kind of self-centeredness, egoism, and, uh, and a care for altruistic, uh, an altruistic concern and care for others and, and for ethics. So I read you this passage. Sorry it's a little long, but it seems, it seems important for a number of reasons. Um, so I'm going to read it and then say a little bit about it. So uh, this is Jeffrey Kripa on the necessity to reject the emancipatory, the liberating illusions in religion and mysticism. I must say, so I think what he says is very important. I'm going to critique also what he says um, after I've read it. But I must say, I don't know if you can sniff like I do a little bit of that kind of um, almost tight and frightened allegiance to a postmodern debunking of everything uh, in, in, in between the lines here. I'm not sure what year it was written in, but uh, I, I kind of vaguely get the whiff of that. Nevertheless, I think he's making some really important points, uh, very intelligent points, and there's more to say uh, in terms of critiquing what he, he himself Uh, in terms of critiquing his critique. So, he writes, Ferrer ultimately adopts a very positive assessment of the tradition's ethical status, um, traditions in the plural, ethical status, suggesting in effect that the religions have been more successful in finding common moral ground than doctrinal or metaphysical agreement. Excuse me. And that most traditions have called for, if never faithfully or fully enacted, a transcendence of dualistic self-centeredness or narcissism. Uh, so Ferrer says, uh, um, yeah, maybe people, different religions and traditions can't agree on um, doctrine and dogmas and metaphysics or whatever, but they all kind of agree on and lead to, um, or agree that they should lead to in their best moments, in their best instantiations, the uh, a care for ethics and this transcending of um, self-centeredness, etc. And then Kripal continues, It is here that I must become suspicious. Though Ferrer himself is refreshingly free of this particular logic, it is really more of a rhetoric, it is quite easy and quite common in the transpersonal literature to argue for the essential moral nature of mystical experience by being very careful about whom one bestows the quite modern title mystic. It is an entirely circular argument, of course. One simply declares, because one believes, that mysticism is moral, then one lists from literally tens of thousands, or perhaps millions, of possible recorded cases, a few, maybe a few dozen, exemplars who happen to fit one's moral standards, or better, whose historical description is sketchy enough to hide any and all evidence that would frustrate those standards, and... Voila, one has proven that mysticism is indeed moral. Any charismatic figure or saint that violates one's norms, and there will always be a very large, loudly screaming crowd here, one simply labels not really a mystic or conveniently ignores altogether. Put differently, it is the constructed category of mysticism itself that mutually constructs a moral mysticism not the historical evidence, which is always and everywhere immeasurably more ambivalent. Ferrer, as is evident in such moments as his thought experiment with the Theravada tree, I don't actually know what that's talking about, sees right through most of this. He knows perfectly well that perennialism simply does not correspond to the historical data. What he does not perhaps see so clearly is that a moral perennialism, so this idea of a moral sort of congruence and... um, 
coming together agreement of uh, issuing from all these different traditions and practices and uh, religions uh, is that a moral perennialism sneaks through the back door of his own conclusions. Thus, where, whereas he rightly rejects all talk of a common core, he can nevertheless speak of a common ocean of emancipation, ocean of liberation, that all the contemplative traditions approach from their different ontological shores, from their different presumptions about reality. Ferrer argues that we must realize that our goal can never be simply the recovery or reproduction of some past sense of the sacred. For we cannot ignore that most religious traditions are still beset not only by intolerant, exclusivist and absolutist tendencies, but also by patriarchy, authoritarianism, dogmatism, conservatism, transcendentalism, body denial, sexual repression, repression and hierarchical institutions. Put simply, the contemplative traditions of the past have too often functioned as elaborate and sacralized techniques for dissociating consciousness. So these, to me these are very, very important points and uh, he's not pulling many punches when he, when he says all this. Once again, I think this is exactly where we need to be with a privileging of the ethical over the mystical and an insistence on human wholeness as human holiness. I would only want to further radicalize Ferrer's vision by underscoring how hermeneutical it is, how it's particularly his interpretation. That is, how it functions as a creative revisioning and reforming of the past instead of as a simple reproduction of or fundamental fantasy about some non-existent golden age. Put differently, in my view, there is no shared ocean of emancipation in the history of religions. Indeed, from many of our own modern perspectives, the waters of the past are barely potable, barely drinkable, as what most of the contemplative traditions have meant by emancipation or salvation is not, not at all what we would like to imply by those terms today. It is, after all, frightfully easy to be emancipated from the world or to become one with a deity or ontological absolute and leave all the world's grossly unjust social structures and practices racism, gender injustice, homophobia, religious bigotry, colonialism, caste, class division, environmental de degradation, etc., comfortably in place. So like I said, a long passage, but um, I think there's a lot of important considerations there. Um, and, of course, uh, part of them are the very reason why I was talking about ethics in the first place, in part. Um, but it may be uh, given all that he said, that um, in part he's missing something of uh, uh, Nikolai Hartmann's points about the uh, nature of, of the realm of values or the nature of the firmament of values. One being that we can only, uh, humanity is only capable at any time of shining a light and illuminating and kind of making out or discerning, uh, seeing, sensing, focusing on and emphasizing a certain narrow radius there uh, of the value, what Harman calls the value firm, the great panoply and, and range of all the values. And secondly, that there are, an, uh, there are antinomies between values. So, uh, in a way... Um, I'm not sure if this is the case with Kirill, but it could be that he's operating from, uh, also from a slightly, let's call it, naive or oversimplistic view of, um, of values. Certainly not in, in much of what he said, but it could be that lurking in there is, is that, um, that uh, kind of narrowness and naivety. Because one might interpret things a little differently. That it is not, uh, for instance, that is not um, emancipation, liberation, awakening um, is, is shown not to bring automatically a moral purity. It could uh, rather be that our idea of morality does not take into account, as I said, the moral antinomies uh, which Hartman writes about draws attention to. Awakening 
could, uh, I would say should, bring with it a moral devotion. Moral devotion, I would say, is a part of the road to awakening and should issue uh, also as part of the goal. So awakening could bring with it a moral devotion, but such, uh, you know, um, but such moral devotion and faithfulness can never be devoted and faithful simultaneously to the totality of moral or value archetypes, or to the, let's say, the figures of the moral zodiac. We talk about imaginal figures embodying different values, different moral values. So there is either a kind of soul element or a cultural conditioning element, or both, involved in determining um, one's moral uh, orientation, one's moral compass and bearing. And whatever that is, whatever that um, uh, bearing is, that orientation is, at the same time will likewise be evaluated by some others who do not share that orientation, that compass, that bearing that evaluation of morals. They have a different, uh, they're looking in a different place. They're evaluating um, values, the, the, relative, the different values differently. And if no one is kind of aware of the fact of the complexity and the kind of multi-directionality of this moral value firmament, then we only have one way of talking about what is moral. One standard, one sort of true north. And uh, Kripal's conclusion will be inevitable regarding our, there is no morality that comes out of mysticism. There's no connection between m- m- mystic insight and so-called awakening and, and morals. Okay. So, but might be based on something that's not fully, uh, some assumptions that are not fully explored. Um, I'm sure I've said this already in the talk, but w- regarding you know ethics and morality, we often want something else that wants a kind of simple, often a simple and unitary kind of easy answer or summary, if not to the complex particularities of ethical life and situations, whether they're actual or hypothetical, and then at least to the theoretical sort of understanding directionality, delineation, scope of, of the values. We want the simplicity. And partly due to the structure, um, or due to the, 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 the range, and um, the kind of transcendent range um, of relative to our human capacity at any time, our culture's capacity at time, partly due to the antinomical structure that exists between values. That simplicity may not may not be um, may not really be possible. And there's also considerations about uh, the nature of the, the soul and the psyche here as well, in terms of our individual tendencies. So Hillman talks about James Hillman talks about uh, a polytheistic psyche, a polytheistic psychology, but also a polytheistic psyche. In other words, that each individual being has, um, each of us has a kind of range of moral allegiances. And they differ according to the ethos of uh, the, the, the imaginal figures that call us and that speak to us, to which we have a duty. Or if we have a duty to just um, just a few, one or just a few um, imaginal figures as kind of very central, then a person over a lifetime, if they have a tendency to those few archetypes, a calling to, a rapport with, a duty to those few archetypes, they will display um, corresponding moral lacunae, gaps, neglects, and transgressions in their in their behaviour. So this is not at all to condone. Uh, I'm sure um, some of the instances we've all read about or encountered of 
kind of gross, inappropriate um, action, behaviour, speech uh, by some teachers and so-called liberated beings and, and mystics. But it's just to say that the, the whole consideration of this may be more complex um, for uh, in, in ways that Kripal doesn't actually consider. And uh, and if we consider that we have a polytheistic psyche, as I've talked about before, I'm pulled in different directions with different a sense of duties that I cannot possibly that will, I cannot possibly execute all those duties. I cannot possibly fulfil all those duties in my life. Certainly not at the same time. I've talked about before this kind of um, calling or um, claim of the god of music that it has on, on me. I cannot fulfill that at the same time as being a Dharma teacher, for instance, and plenty uh, plenty others. And this is the nature, this is part of our f- existential finitude and fragmentation. But to me it has a, a kind of noble tragedy, and it has a beauty, it, has this, it retains this beyondness, as opposed to it's a, a kind of... Uh, f- finitude and fragmentation that tends to then flatten and um, uh, uh, render a kind of sense of uh, beyondness and nobility in, in the fuller sense of the, the flourishing and the beauty of nobility and how it can grow uh, flattens it. So all, all this to me is interesting. I don't have this... You can hear the different tendencies in the way different people think about this or how they seek for a solution. It's possible, certainly theoretically, or if one wants to or if one feels um, at any time, well, that, this way of thinking about it is soul-making or feels soul-making. I can feel it be soul-making. It's possible um, to retain the notion of some kind of absolute, some transcendent synthesis that's possible among these antinomies. I can't quite understand it or how it would manifest, but it's possible to retain that, have a even prayerful, meditative, contemplative, um, intuitive kind of glimpse or sense or taste of that, and at the same time recognize uh, an impossibility in, in instantiation an impossibility in certain situations, in the structure of the situation, or because of these antinomies, um, these kind of inherent, uh, polarly opposite, uh, differing directional pulls between values. And recognize the impossibility because of those, uh, if you like, the, the structure of our psyche being um, as what him would call polytheistic in nature polydevotional, polytheistically devotional, polytheistically called different angels pulling us and uh, in different different conflicting directions demanding different things of us. It's not actually possible for this human life to to um, perfectly, adequately encompass all that, hold it all together at the same time. So there's something really important in all this, I feel, and um, again, it matters what our attitude to it is. So again, that the attitude would also be part of what what would constitute a virtue. What's my? Um, it's one thing to be conscious of of these different kind of impossibilities. Um, it's another then to. Uh, let them touch the soul and the, and the mind and the heart in ways that are ennobling, in ways that uh, are vitalizing, difficult as that might be, challenging as that might be, uh, complicating as that might be. There's something, I think, necessary for the soul there, to some extent. But attitude matters, and attitude to this very situation is, um, or this this kind of situation, is is itself a, uh, or can be the virtuous or or not so virtuous. So again, let me read another passage from Hartman if I can find it, um, and 
he's talking about, um, I think, the antinomy between love of the nearest and love of the remote. And uh, he criticizes Nietzsche, actually, who, in his devotion for love of the remote, um, uh, kind of poo-pooed and neglected also in his life, I think, um, love of the nearest to some extent. And he also makes the point that, you know, it's it sometimes falls to the um, the founder, the discoverer, the adventurer, the one who um, opens up new territory first. It sometimes falls to them or goes with that role, unfortunately, to be a little um, one-pointed and therefore neglectful. We talked about this when we went in Hartman's um, antinomy of grade and range, this kind of concentrating on one um, ideal value and the development of that and the manifestation of that to the neglect of others and sometimes putting others down. So he criticizes Nietzsche for that. And he's talking about this, um, generally this antinomy uh, between love of the nearest and love of the remotest, criticizing Nietzsche for um, praising love of the remotest at the uh, expense of, of a kind of to, almost total neglect of love of the nearest. But there's a general point about, a wider point about antinomies in general. And Hartman writes, the fact of their antinomy does not release us from the task of blending two values. The fact of their antinomy does not release us from the task of blending two values. In itself, love of the nearest, for example, is right and must not be discarded. So I cannot completely, um, I have to give some care, some attention for those that are near me, for my circle of immediate friends, the people I run into every day, my family, etc. I have to have, um, I, I cannot discard, as Hartman said, that, that value. If precedence should be given to a higher value, the lower at most should be restricted in its domination. In other words, we don't totally uh, neglect it, totally disregard it. We just um, uh, restrict it at most. The conflict, the antinomy, leads to a reciprocal restoration of both values. In every synthesis, the conflict must on principle be retained. So that retaining that conflict means retaining the sense of the conflict, retaining the sense of being pulled in different directions. I'm sure there's some mythical figure that was pulled in different directions. I can't remember who that was. So there's a tension here. There's an inevitable challenge, an inevitable tension, an inevitable difficulty of choice uh, that we encounter um, regularly and in different ways and in all kinds of uh, levels of ethical life and all, all kinds of uh, gradations of difficulty in our life. And we want, to, we need, Hartman saying, we need to keep that conflict. We can't just choose completely in favor of one versus the other. But neither is it, as I said, this flaccid kind of, eh, well, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. This kind of... Um, dull and a little bit soul-dead kind of middle-of-the-road tendency. I've got to kind of live with uh, and kind of have the capacity for and the maturity for holding and navigating this conflict, holding this tension. So when we talked about Eros, this is a very different kind of tension, but we talked about Eros needing to maintain the two and not collapse into oneness, merge. Uh, a, a, a tension needs to be uh, retained with eros, an erotic tension between the soul and its beloved um, uh, erotic imaginal other. Uh, and there's a different kind of tension here, but again, for our soul's growth, for our... Um, the building of our moral being, as Hartman has it, uh, for our uh, creativity and discovery, that tension needs to be uh, maintained to some degree.
So often we want um, simple answers, as I say, and, and a kind of simple code of ethics. And when we start to go into it in more detail, it's, it's, things are more complex. Things are not so easy. Not so um, uh, uh, facilely unifiable. Again, passage from Hartman. Goodness consists in selecting values according to their relative height from among the diversity which is always met with in any given circumstance. Um, so remember we said that was his definition of goodness. It's like the, the tendency to choose the higher. Um, and this selection of the higher, uh, the, the relatively higher among different values, um, is a selection, he says, which cannot be made uh, similarly, so it's Latin, it just means just once in a lifetime. You cannot just, um, okay, I've made that decision now and that's done. It cannot be made purely theoretically either, he says, once and for all, but must be made anew each time from the very foundation, out of an ever-living sense of value. There can be no diagram to assist us in this, no help from precepts or rules of life. It is selection not by way of contemplative uh, deliberation, he means not by way of rational thinking, but through the intuitive element in our impulse towards the higher, an element which is always generated in our actions, in our dispositions, desires and behaviour, or, on the other hand, is sometimes lacking. So, we are... Uh, Forced to, we are asked to live ethical complexity. And um, that's hard. It's hard. So we do have precepts, we have um, commandments, etc. And uh, an interesting point is... Um, that they often refer to a kind, and they're, they're simplifying, and that's why a lot of people kind of uh, can you know, find the precepts of the commands very helpful as codes of life, but they are uh, simplifying. And you get in the Jewish tradition, you know, there's ten commandments, and then um, volumes and volumes um, of uh, small print, if you like, uh, regarding the nuances and different situations that comes in, in, the, in the Talmudic commentaries, in the encyclopedic um, volumes. Um, the commands themselves are very simple. Um, this kind of simplicity is only possible for what Hartman would call the lowest values. Um, the, but lowest in the sense that they form the basis. Uh, they form the minimum. So much as we would like, or sometimes we would like to just think, I'm just keeping the precepts, that's, that's it, that takes care of things. And in a way, as I said, right, I think at the start of this talk, you know, um, they can, f or in a way, they function for the sake of simplicity, those precepts, and the whole movement of sila in Buddha Dharma was originally um, taught because it simplifies our life. And, as, and, purifies us from the kind of uh, negative consequences of um, contravening those precepts which would uh, obviate and, and get, uh, obstruct our path to liberation. But actually they're a minimum and those commandments are a minimum. Ten commandments or the last five commandments which deal with, the first five deal with um, human beings' relationship to God and the last five deal with human beings' relationship with each other. Those last five are a kind of minimum. But as a minimum, they form the basis. They form um, the kind of minimal allegiance we, we, must, uh, we must have. Um, and is it enough? Is it uh, complete? Is it too simple? So, again, I'll read you. I'm reading a lot of Hartman, but... Um, so, he says... Um, 
he's talking about justice, but it, the point is similar. So, um, and he said that he's previously said that Socrates and Plato put justice as the highest moral value, but he says actually among the virtues proper, justice is to be classed not as the highest, but rather as the lowest. This is seen in the fact that in justice, um, the ought to be puts forth not the maximum of moral demand, but quite evidently the minimum. Its claim upon a, a person's conduct is purely negative not to do injustice, to commit no transgression, not to encroach upon another's liberty, not to injure another or anything that belongs to him. And same in, in, the, in the, um, the last five of the Ten Commandments, not to murder, not to steal, not to commit adultery, not to bear false witness, uh, or covet what is uh, not yours. And he says, if that is the whole meaning of morality, its tendency is merely conservative, not constructive. The one concern is the protection, the conservation of the lower, the elementary goods. In other words, life, property, family, etc. If that is the whole of justice, then it is only a means to those good value, goods values. If that's the whole of ethics, then it's only a means to those kinds of things. But that, he says, that doesn't... Uh, that doesn't exhaust the essence of justice. Because, in the first place, behind those goods values is hidden something of positive moral value, the sphere of personal freedom. Justice merges into respect for this, he says. But beyond it, there rises something still greater. The higher spiritual, the communal and cultural values, one and all, can flourish only where body, life, property, personal freedom of actions and the like are secured. There only is scope found for the higher purposes. So in other words, we need these basics, body, life, property, personal freedom of action, um, to a certain extent. Um, where they are there, then on that basis, uh, the, the higher purposes of life, the more beautiful uh, reaches of um, ethics uh, are, are based, but they bring with them complications. Justice, then, he continues, makes room in the sphere of actuality for the higher values. The more diversified moral life cannot begin till the simple conditions are supplied. Justice is the moral tendency to supply these conditions. It is the prerequisite of all further realizations of value. Justice is the minimum of morality that paves the way for all the higher forms. So, and when we get into those higher forms, again, that's uh, where a lot of the complexity comes in. And a lot of these anti antinomical, antinomial relations come in. And we meet with them, and we encounter them, and we have to grapple with them. We have to choose. And again, I can't remember if I said this before, but um, in choosing, in in being, in having to choose, the situation forces forces a choice on us, presents us with a choice. We can try and avoid that choice, but that itself is is not a virtue. It's a kind of moral cowardice. So we're presented with a choice, and in many situations, either by, by uh, because of the structure of the situation, or because of the actual antinomical relationship between values um, in, uh, that are called, um, uh, called for as responses to, to that situation, that life situation, we will end up choosing one uh, pair, one side of a pair of antinomial values, or uh, over another. And uh, it's impossible to avoid that. So, um, he says, um, someone who is in such a situation cannot avoid making a decision, what I just said. Every attempt to remain neutral only makes the difficulty worse, in that he thereby violates both values. So in other words, to try and to refuse to make a choice, to do nothing, to withdraw, to shrink back from the situation, is uh, you end up neither value if those two there are in opposition, in antinomial or structural opposition. You end up not uh, not devoted to, not manifesting either value. 
you thereby violate both values, he says. The attempt not to commit oneself is at bottom moral cowardice, a lack of the sense of responsibility and of the willingness to assume it. And often enough it is also due to moral immaturity, if not to the fear of others. So how often are we afraid of what, what other people think of us? But also there's this fear of um, the consequences of our choice, which in, in many situations will be, I have to relatively neglect one value for the sake of um, my devotion for my expressing or manifesting or caring for another value. What a person ought to do when they are confronted with a serious conflict that is fraught with responsibility is this, he says, to decide according to his, his best conscience, that is, according to his own living sense of the relative height of the respective values, and to take upon himself the consequences, external as well as inward, ultimately the guilt involved in the violation of the one value. He ought to carry the guilt, and in so doing become stronger, so that he can carry it with pride. Real moral life, he continues, is not such that one can stand guiltless in it. Real moral life is not such that one can stand guiltless in it. And that each person must step by step in life settle conflicts insoluble theoretically. Conflicts which... uh, you can't actually solve them to uh, to the satisfaction of both uh, the, the demands of both antithetical moral values. And that each person must step by step in life settle conflicts, insoluble theoretically, by his own free sense of values and his own creative energy, should be regarded as a feature of the highest spiritual significance. in complete humanity and genuine freedom. Yet one must not make of this a comfortable theory, as the vulgar mind makes of the permissible lie, imagining that one brings upon oneself no guilt in offending against clearly discerned values. It is only unavoidable guilt which can preserve a man from moral decay. So even a Buddha must choose will be confronted um, by certain situations in life where uh, this value uh, uh, gets chosen gets emphasized gets cared for um, to the neglect of some um, opposing or conflicting value both are valuable Both um, have a legitimate claim, but even a Buddha must choose, and and there are consequences. So I don't know, maybe um, the the, the Siddhartha Gautama at 28 or whatever he was, and leaving his family, he had a, a very young son and a wife, and he left them. So he was up for for the uh, to, to to strive for awakening and the possibility of awakening, which he intuited. He's choosing one value, the value of awakening, over another value, the value of um, uh, caring for his family, the virtue of um, being a loving and responsible husband and father. Sometimes he said we want some once and for all answer to sort it all out. We want some simple code. We want to uh, some rational idea of how to navigate it all. We want it, um, and we want to be um, simple and guiltless. And and these things may not be possible. They're not possible. There are some other elements to consider in all this, which I think I'll come back to uh, next time. 
Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.